so good afternoon everybody um for those of you that don't know me i'm andrew taylor i'm technical officer here at asfp and today we're doing a, a one hour webinar on the subject of pfp and refurbishment projects which i hope you find very interesting i'm going to be joined we've got two guest speakers joining us for a, a session today we've got barry beavis of sharp fiber and we've got john dunk from pfp specialists who are going to do a little a, a, Cool case studies for us. So, how's today going to work? Uh, it's the usual format for those of you who have who've been to one of our webinars. So, I do a quick welcome to the webinar. Uh, we are going to take questions, and we've got a Q and A session toward at the end of the the webinar. Um, please, if you have any questions as we go through, can you put them on the Q and A box, which you will find at the top of your screen in the in the Zoom controls. There is a chat box available as well, but we'd ask if you could put the any questions you want us to deal with in the Q&A box. That's where we'll be looking from. Uh, I've set a couple of three polls up as we go through just to gauge your um, interest and your 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 involvement in this and areas that we can concentrate on going forwards. OK, so that's our the, the technicalities of how we're set up. Um, the ASFP webinar pro I'll, in, I'll give you some dates where we are with the ASFP webinar program in a minute, then we get on to the presentation Q and a addressed by the panel at the end. All right, so our webinar timetable um, the stuff in grey there is the stuff that we've already done this year, and this is today we've got a member update coming next in August Wednesday the 11th of August. And on Wednesday, the 18th of September, we're going to do a webinar on structural protection with a couple of case studies in there for you. OK, so and there will be some more dates to come thereafter. And as ever, um, this webinar has been CPD accredited through the Institution of Fire Engineers. Uh, so can you e please email info at asfp.org.uk if you want a, a CPD certificate, um, do that within two weeks of the end of the webinar, please. I would point out, we will show you that address right at the very, very end as well. And just so you know, we are recording this webinar. If you are watching this webinar on catch up, as it were, and um, we can't do CPD certificates for that. But if you're watching this webinar live at 12.05 on the 21st of July and you want a CPD certificate, that's the email address to send it to. So today, what are we going to talk about? Well, I'm going to do a quick introduction. We've got a fire stopping case study, which is being done by Barry Beavis. We've got a structural fire protection case study, which is done by John Dunk. I'm going to talk a bit about some of the future regulatory changes it being an important day, the building safety bill currently under debate in Parliament, and then we'll do Q&A and closing remarks at the end. Which brings me to my customary question one, uh, poll question one, which the office has just launched for me, and it's basically so that we can get a, a feel as we present this to who we're talking to, what's your main interest? And that should say in refurbishment, not in modern methods of compartmentation. Um, that's a the, the power of cut and paste and getting it wrong. I'm sure I'll be getting some some remarks on that one. So can you just add, let me know where you where you come from uh, and what you're interested in this topic is? Thank you. So we've got we've got a broad spread of people today. Um, fire engineers inspect fire engineers 19% we've got 11% in building control 16% fire risk assessors manufacturers architects and designers specifiers so it's, it's a very very broad remit that we're dealing with all of you interested in 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 hopefully in refurb okay so if that's that's the case thank you very much right we'll move on and I'll do my introduction bit so um the big challenge and really one of the, the biggest challenges that I come across within my daily life working within ASFP is that people will ring me up and say questions along the lines of I'm trying to refurb this old building I have no idea what I have in this building and I'll get questions around the fact that 
you know, I've got a, a fire door which has got some 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 white mastic in. Is there around the around the reveal? Is there a generic detail to cover that? And the, of course, you turn around and say, well, no, there's no generic details in in fire stopping. It's manufactured. It's, it's tested products that are manufactured, and and it depends on the scope of the test information for that particular product. Do you know what the product is? And they say, no, I just know it's white mastic. At which point you that your follow up question is usually, well, how do you know it's even a fire resisting mastic? How do you know it's not just a decorator's cork? So, so one of the big challenges is the lack of information and the information should be there. There is a regulatory requirement to provide information. It's regulation 38 tucked away at the back of um, ADB. And yeah, you can see it there. All the provisions, the same provision exists within building regulations in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. It's subtly different, but the same provision exists there. So basically, for in, in the in, in the UK, where for buildings where regulatory reform fire safety order applies, then there should be a fire safety information file that's given to the responsible person for that building, either at the completion of works or at first occupation. There are all sorts of, of things in there, it, it, including as a plan of the building as it's built. It should give you the location of all the fire separating elements. It should give you a location, the information of all the compartment lines. It should give you information of where all the cavity barriers are. In, in fact, it should give you full information of, of all the passive fire safety measures. You know, it should tell you what the products are, where they are, what they're meant to do, why they're meant to do it, and give you detailed um, maintenance requirements okay the problem is this hasn't been done well and even if it is done if it is received does the file get paid any attention and quite often the, the information goes missing and so we're left with no knowledge of what it's what what is what and the, obviously the question is does that pfp get inspected and maintained properly and are the maintenance schedules observed or are they misplaced? And quite often we end up in a situation where it doesn't happen and you end up with needing a, a greater level of refurbishment than you might otherwise have needed. Now, under um, the Regulatory Reform Act, as you see there, England and Wales, the, it's, there's, you need to do a, regulate, a regular fire risk assessment. OK, it's, it's covered in there under, under Section 9. And, and you, you would need to do that on a regular basis. And you also need to do that fire risk assessment. It, again, if there's any significant change in the premises, which includes extensions or conversions or, or, or changes in use and things like that. And therefore that brings, a, so, and, and when those happen, you've got to bring those, um, you've got to bring those, the, the building to the, meet the regulations at the time, at the current time. OK, so I, when might this cause a problem? Well, I've got a couple of pictures here for you with the infamous. Here's a, a maintenance issue. You know, here's a, a, a I was out walking um, recently, walked past this building, I, a particular building. I know this particular building has um, intermescent coatings. Here's a, a structural steel column on the outside of the building. And it's obvious that the intermescent coatings not been properly maintained. There's, there's scenes and evidence of breakdown on there. And given the fact that the, the primer's rusting through, it, it's quite imaginable that in fact, there's, there's something that's there that's actually showing some signs of breakdown. The other one, of course, is, is the classic is that you get cables Somebody comes along and adds, runs cables through above a false ceiling after completion of building. And there's, you know, here's a case where cables have been run and there's no consideration given to fire stopping through that compartment line. OK, and that's a, a common challenge that we see on site. So, you know, there's a, a couple of issues that on, on an annual risk assessment should be causing, should be being flagged up and saying, what, what do we do? How do we do it? Now, for the moment, ASFP does have some advice that you can find on how best to do this going forward. Um, one is uh, advisory note nine, and advisory note nine that's on the on our ASFP website does give you advice on on retrofit of fire stopping. 
and and it's as with all of these things as we just said first instance try and determine what you have and if you can't it's safest to remove and replace and if it's impractical and there are certainly areas where it is such as large load bearing compound seals there's advice given on on why it might be appropriate and and what to do if you're going to a, a, amend an existing fire seal on what data and what what information you would need to provide having done that there's also a guide information this is and this is quite a, a an old document technical guidance document 10 um, and that gives advice on refurbishing structural steelwork protection and and first advice again is if you don't know what it is best practice is to remove um, and, and it doesn't really support advise re patch repairing with another system. It's not re recommended unless you've got supporting evidence that you can find that 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 makes this this around. So so those are the 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 things that you need to consider. Okay, and the code of practice there for refurbishment and upgrade. Right, which brings me to poll question two. Uh, so have you ever worked on a refurbishment project where you've no idea what the pre-existing uh, passive fire protection product was and if so how did you deal with it and so here come the results so nearly 70 percent of you have worked on such a project and the vast majority of you in those in instances completely removed and replaced although a significant quantity have done carried out a technical evaluation of what was there only a small number just assumed what was in what was in place was sufficient. That's good to see. That's good to see. Right. That gets me to the end of my introduction. I'm now going to hand you over to Barry Beavis of Sharp Fiber. Barry's one of the the um, the, the directors at Sharp Fiber, and he's going to take us through a case study regarding fire stopping. Barry, away you go. Good. Thanks, Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Barry Bubis. I'm the sales director at Sharp Fibre. If I could ask you to move on a slide. I'm going to um, talk to you about, uh, not necessarily in this order, the issues we face when uh, fire or, or attending a refurbishment project, um, fire risk assessments. And I'm going to be very gentle with that because I know that 16% of you are fire risk assessors. Um, and then I'm going to show you a case study of uh, precisely um, a building that we have uh, completed the uh, refurbishment of the fire protection. Andy, next slide. Thanks. Just worth reminding ourselves what it is that we deal with here. One more, Andy. Um, there is no dry run for what we do. We hope it's never used to passive fire protection, but when it is, it has to work and it has to work first time. Um, and that's why we take care in what we do. Um, when we uh, complete a refurbishment project generally the information given to us right at the very start comes from a fire risk assessment what we have here is fairly typical of the information that's presented to us and i've circulated the the circled the two important areas andy um, no fire door or compartmentation to stop the spread of fire from the flats uh, from different uh, levels and the suggestion is a fire door needs to be installed at the top of the basement stairwell to create the compartmentation. Um, the fire risk assessment or information that's provided to us is sometimes sketchy. And here's an exact example of why it is, because as you can see, uh, putting a door um, on either of those stairs isn't going to create the separation required. Thank you. Um, other issues that we are regularly faced with, uh, one more Andy, include uh, tenants belongings uh, stuffed cupboards um, just things that become incredibly difficult for us to deal with it's why uh, it, it's it's why a, a refurbishment project is always going to be uh, five six seven eight times the cost of installing the, the passive fire protection correctly in the first instance and if you go on one more, Andy, I have a photograph uh, taken from a fire risk assessment uh, where it said there's a penetration above a door that's filled with foam, removed the foam and seal. Uh, but the fire risk assessor completely missed the fact that there's a trunking above the door as well. One more, Andy. And you can see that actually not only is there trunking that's created a penetration, 
the wall has not been constructed correctly. So uh, the information that we sometimes get as, a, as an installer, as an operator, um, doesn't uh, help us solve the problems. Um, taking you to an, uh, an exact example, this is uh, a very typical um, project constructed in London. One more, Andy. Um, uh, it's not unusual. It's it's nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of these. Um, the agent said, if you press the button for me, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, the agent said how extremely spacious and highly specified the accommodation is. The reality when we arrive on site to attend to the fire stopping is an entirely different picture. And in fact, when inspected uh, by Exover Warrington, the message given is entirely different to that that the estate agent said. So taking us through the project, um, there are a number of issues uh, in pretty much all of the construction of the building. And I'm gonna show you some of those now. Um, so firstly, we have uh, penetrations through walls that are, well, the, the slide says no fire protection. I'd argue that the wall's not been built correctly. Um, the, one more, Andy, the services through the floors, again, are not sealed. Um, no fire stopping is evident through the walls through the floors. And when it is evident where passive fire protection has been installed, uh, my favourite, the one screw fix. Um, alternately, there are incorrect materials, incorrectly used, not as manufacturer would uh, uh, have tested. Um, that's repeated uh, throughout the building. And bearing in mind, this is an actual building that was actually built and actually sold. People lived in these flats. And this is the status of the building when we get to it. Uh, what we do is we come in and uh, if you hit the button for me, Andy, uh, we correctly seal the services as they run through floors, one more, as they run through the, the head of wall, as services penetrate through walls, everything is labelled, uh, there's a full documented uh, report of who did what, when they did it, where they did it, uh, what materials they used, the locations, uh, so that's full traceability. Um, and if you go one more, the risks are that not everybody understands passive fire protection, um, that other trades uh, don't necessarily know how to, uh, how to put passive fire protection into a building in the same way that you wouldn't ask me to come and install the electricity or the electrics throughout the building because I don't know what I'm doing, but I am a, a specialist in passive fire protection. Um, but how do you assess competency? And that's the big question. Um, if you're specifying, what would you do? Which of these look more competent to carry out your triple height bypass just by looking? Andy, is it this guy, this guy, this one? Or do you want this one? doing your triple heart bypass. You can't tell just from looking. So um, the best way to assess competency, Andy, uh, to stop this and the expense of this, to stop us from having to uh, build a tunnel within which to work in somebody else's kitchen and the expense of that, Andy, the best recommendation that I can give you is to always use an ASFP member. Competency is a legal obligation. You are required to ensure. Uh, and the best way of doing that is have an ASFP member complete your passive fire protection for you. Thanks, Andy. I'll take questions at the end. Thanks, Barry. Thank you very much. So that's quick canter through that 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 case study that I've, I've i've seen some of that before but I'm, I'm sure hopefully that's new to some of you i'm now going to to hand the the floor over to john dunk of pfp specialists and he's going to give us um a case study on structural steel pacifier protection 
um, I would say I've noticed that somebody's got the hand up in the in the participants box. We, we with this being a, a webinar, we can't deal with that, and we can't take Q and A. Just just type them into the Q and A box, please, and we'll we'll deal with them at the end. Okay, John, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Andy. Right, if we go to the first slide, please. Right, so um, what, what we're seeing is that building owners and operators are being becoming aware of the increased requirements for fire safety capability in buildings and what responsibilities they have for what PFP is installed and Grenfell and recent changes in regulation and responsibilities are focusing attention on this. Uh, so passive fire protection in this context could include boarding, intumescent coatings or cement based coatings applied to the steelworks or in some case to reinforced concrete structures, uh, which interestingly we dealt with recently. A fire safety strategy for buildings will typically set out what the fire request, what the fire resistant requirements are, and it's often stated in a fire resistance period. 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and even 120 minutes. So in new construction and recently constructed buildings, it is very likely that the passive fire protection method used will have been documented in design, specification, and construction. So somebody will know what's there and, and why it was put there. Next slide, Andy, please. Um, but recently, there's been quite an increase in interest by building owners, developers, and others uh, to determine what fire resistance they have installed where there is no documentation available. And uh, this situation is obviously a big concern to building owners and managers. Not being able to understand what fire protection materials are there uh, means that there can be no proof of fire protection or to what standard it might be protected. So this can, satisfy, this can carry many risks uh, associated with satisfying approval authorities or indeed compliance with uh, in insurance requirements. So where structural fire resistance cannot be adequately determined, remedial action may be required, which could mean stripping out of what was there and reinstatement with a, a known product. And that was touched on a little earlier when people talked about, you know, yeah, I okay, strip and repair, strip and replace. But very clearly, there are major logistical and commercial implications in doing that, particularly in the building that's actually operational or people are, are, are occupying it. Next slide, Andy, please. So um, we get called in, and here's a good case example where we have been called in. Uh, where there's no documentation to identify the material or its fire resistance capability. Uh, and somebody says, what is it? And so you will see a situation like that where you can see a structural beam that's being fire protected in this case with uh, a cementitious based material. And the second photograph there, you will see uh, a sample that's been removed from the surface. Next slide, please. So, what we have done in that case and in other cases, um, we will go and do a general visual inspection. So hopefully that will identify the generic material type, be it cementitious, intumescent or other. It will also give us an overview of the condition and stability and adhesion and uniformity of the material. And when I say stability, is it, is it looking good? Is it likely to just fall away if you touch it? or is it strong and well adhered to the surface? And the visual inspection may give some indicators of what the original material was. Um, and in that situation, we will send somebody who's got good knowledge. If we know in advance it's cementitious, we will send somebody who's got uh, a lot of experience with cementitious materials. And it might be that they are able to look at it and say, well, there's a good chance it's A, B, or C and not have to start with a whole list of you know, tens or dozens of materials that uh, might, be, might have been used. We will also use desk investigation, and that's working through industry contacts, contacts rather, and product catalog investigation of what might have been used and what was the fire protection capability. Next slide, please. So then we then move to uh, close visual inspection. And that's on a prescribed process regarding um, a stated number of inspection points that would be set out in advance with the client. 
thickness measurement of deployed materials of the inspection points and adhesion checks are often carried out. And then we take samples of the material for laboratory analysis, and that's both physical and chemical pro properties, and in some cases utilizing fairly sophisticated composition analysis methods by laboratories that are actually qualified to carry out that work. And some of the simple stuff might be, for example, with a cementitious material, taking product samples and having a density measurement. And that's important because then that can lead you into a specific type of material that's being used or even a particular manufacturer's type of material that can be used or might have been used at that time through the density of the product installed. It's not 100%, but it does give you some guidance. Next slide, please. So um, this is a particular study um, investigation that we did. This was a refurbishment project, a large London-based project, queried the fire resistance of what appeared to be a cementitious coating applied to steel frame as part of a 1980s refurbishment. And that was interesting because they thought it was 1980s, but it could have been a few years either side of that. So when we looked at what was installed, it was well bonded to the steel. Uh, and whilst we did site surveys and laboratory assessments to identify the material, it could not be conclusively identified to a precise manufacturer's material. Uh, and so therefore we were, we were left in a very difficult situation. Um, and as the last bullet on that slide says, um, there were a lot of money involved here, um, multi-millions in fact, because the building had been predominantly converted, uh, it had been refurbished, and for somebody to go in and strip out what was there and replace it with a known material, uh, not only were you talking major construction delays and therefore delivery of the building for its new use, but also major disruption whilst existing product was stripped out and, and put back in. So what we did there was to do further lab assessments on a range of samples, and we actually did uh, thermal analysis and produced some thermal properties for the material. Uh, and we took the measured thickness. We then used our chartered engineer to uh, take the heat transfer data from the product and actually work it back and say, okay, well, in a fire situation for this duration, this is the uh, temperature the steel is going to get to. So in short, what we were able to do was to demonstrate that the 60 minute requirement there, the steel would be less than its critical temperature requirement as advised by the structural engineer for the project. But it didn't stop there. We then had to go to a quantified assessment uh, which was subject to review by an independent fire engineer and the approval authority. But we passed both of those points as well, and everybody signed, signed off and said, yep, yeah, okay, this structure has the required fire resistance requirements. So as I commented on, the outcome there was a saving of multi-millions, which should have been required had the material had to be removed and replaced. And I think that's the last slide, Andy. It is, John. It is. Thank That's you very good. much. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we'll take, obviously, take you come back at the end and take questions, I hope. Um, we've got about nine questions, nine, ten questions in the Q&A box at the moment. So keep them coming, please. OK, so I'm just going to do a quick canter through uh, future regulatory changes um, just to and how these could potentially impact and hopefully make the, the maintenance side of things easier um, and refurbishment side of things. So I'm sure many of you will already know that uh, the fire safety bill was enacted in, in April 2021. And that was the piece of legislation that, that just adds some more weight and some clarification to certain things within the regulatory reform fire safety order. External walls are now common, do, deemed common parts of buildings as are flat front doors. OK, um, next up is the building safety bill. Uh, the second draft of that document, we've waited for a long while and was published on the, um, the 5th of July, which was coincidentally the, the same day that Boris was doing his big uh, Freedom Day is coming speech. 
and the second draft of the building safety bill is actually being debated in parliament today most of the discussions that you're picking up in the press and on the and in, in the news about the building safety bill is still on the subject of who pays for the fact for the for the building stock that's out there along the lines of the, the case study that that um that barry just showed us where where people have bought a building in good faith expecting it to be fire safe and it isn't expecting it to be a safe building and it isn't and so so that's and whether this proposed extension of the legal time frame for for leaseholders to be able to make a claim back or is going to work or not um there seems there seems to be more of a of a thought in the press that it won't and so where, where again where that discussion goes within the commons today will be interesting to see and the building safety bills the idea is that it's going to underpin the the work needed to enact the 53 recommendations from judith hackett's building a safer future report way back in um in 2018 right one of the key things that we know is in the building safety bill is a more stringent rec regime for high risk residential buildings in occupation okay there's going to be a new accountable person and and we're going to have a new that person is going to have to appoint a building safety manager to assess the safety risks and take steps to control it and a, a couple of key things here there's two, there's two key things at the bottom of that slide there they're going to have to produce a safety case report and they're going to have to maintain the information about the building that's the, it's called the golden thread and i've got two slides on those two topics alone on safety cases and golden thread because this is going to make a, a big difference going forwards okay golden thread data on the original design and subsequent changes held digitally um, and for new builds you're going to have to collect this during design and construction to be handed over to the accountable person at occupation and that information will form a key part of the safety case going forwards so hopefully from and the point of view of what we're talking about today having that information having that golden thread information digitally will make it easy to undertake um it, it, and and therefore that will make um that will make maintenance and refurbishment easier in the future the other fact is of course the safety case okay and i've still yet to get a better picture of a safety case than that um and at the moment we don't know what the, the, the safety case pro forma is going to look like because we haven't hse haven't haven't come up with one and put one into the into out of out to people to to peer review but um I, I, when we get to a building being occupied there's going to need to be a safety case and that safety case, the, the the new regulator, which is HSE, will use that safety case to ish produce a building assurance certificate, right? And that will and and this building assurance certificate is going to be applied not just to new builds, but ultimately it's going to be be applied to all buildings in scope of the building safety bill, okay? All high risk buildings, and that's going to be done retrospectively. And the key question it for into your safety case is: Can you identify the safety risks in the building? Show how you manage them, and on an ongoing basis, so that the building is safe. Okay. And one of the key quite things that have HSE have said in a couple of webinars on this is: Not knowing what's in your building going forwards will not be acceptable. Okay. So there's there's going to need to be some evidence of 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 we know what is it how is it how does it work we're going to need to go back and and, and find that okay so we know there's a, a new regulatory regime coming and and in some way shapes and forms we're already actually getting it whilst the legislation is coming forwards hse will be our new building safety regulator they, it, while we're waiting for that to be set up they're being referred to as the shadow regulator um they're going to have a, a, a delegate key responsibility responsibilities to um locals either locals in the health and safety exec or local authorities or fire and rescue services and the, that will put together a multiplicity disciplinary team 
from all of those organizations to make regulatory assessments for buildings wherever necessary. And a reminder that the, 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 the Hackett report set up this as a, a gateway series staged approach um, where gateway one, we have a, a planning stage. So have you thought about the building safety and fire safety, especially before you're even before you even start to draw up the, as you start to draw up plans? Gateway two is a is a detail. You produce a detail. Once you've got planning permission, you produce a detailed design. And that detailed design has all sorts of questions that drags more detail into that process um, earlier as that conversation is. And then beyond that, gateway three completion stage. So, so in effect, gateway one is gives is planning permission. Gateway two is design. Is, you've designed it permission to construct, and gateway three is permission to occupy. That gives you a building certificate and a safety case going forwards, and all that is underpinned by the golden thread. We see some secondary legislation for the for the um, building safety bill coming out already. Um, the HSE's new shadow regulatory shadow regulator, Peter Barker, Baker, is our new chief inspector of buildings, and we know that HSE is going live with the first gateway for high risk residential buildings as of the first of August, and so there's a whole stuff of a lot of that set up, and they're now setting up um, what's called an interim industry competence committee. So they can't set up the industry competence committee because they're not the formal regulator, they're only the shadow regulator. And so the group has been set up as the interim industry competence committee. And that will, is under the, the, the auspices. The, the chair is a guy called John Vanstone. And there's a number of people from across industry being brought in to, to run that committee going forwards. And that was, so we will see more and more involvement with HSE getting more and more involved in buildings as we go forwards. Okay. That brings me pretty much nicely and neatly to, to poll question three. Um, are you going to be involved, do you think, in, in compiling these safety cases for existing, existing buildings that are going to come into scope for HSE's jurisdiction? Um, the relevant buildings at the moment, it's 18 metres or seven storeys, but we will all, we expect a more prosaic risk-based approach going forwards. Um, and, and if you are going to be involved in these, um, buildings do you think you've got sufficient information in your hands or not i'd be intrigued to know where you get uh, here we go so 43 percent of you could well be and you think that 26 and, and, and of that 43 percent over half think that they have sufficient information in their hands already which is good to know um obviously the the uh third of you two-fifths of you that don't have sufficient information in there, but that's hopefully this has got you thinking that you need to start getting some to, to try and understand what the risks of your of your building are and, and where you're going to go with it. OK, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to deal with the, this. I'm going to wrap this up now and, and start the Q&A. But before I do, um, I thought that, you know, the lack of existing data can make refurbishment difficult, but hopefully this is going to change in future. Um, if in doubt, complete replacements, obviously the, the best option. But as John's shown us, we've got um, we've got we've got steps you can take to avoid this. Um, and, and one of the key messages that we keep getting as we go through this from HSE and from Dame Judith herself is, you know, with these new regulations are coming, but, but don't wait till the new regulations hit. You know what they're going. We know what they're going to be. They're being telegraphed well enough for us. So really do the, you know, do the right thing now. I've got a, a, a picture here. This is a picture, a project that, that I was involved in in a, in a past life. Um, I don't know if you recognize it, the, the, the top picture is the undercroft at St Pancras. And it used to be um, basically what they would do is they would bring beer down the, the Midland Railway line from Burton into London. And this was, and it was be unloaded and, and distributed through the undercroft at St Pancras, um, the undercroft, that's the undercroft today, 
and you can tell that's the Undercroft today because there's no passengers because there's no trains to to on the Eurostar, hardly any trains on the Eurostar at the moment because nobody's going anywhere. But um, there is, you know, that was that was a massive change of use, and there was an awful lot of stuff done in in terms of verifying the performance of the systems that were applied there. Samples were taken off site; they were coated with intumescent, and um, and and then and then fire tested to make sure that everything was going to work. So uh, I know that that's a, a system that I've 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 done I've, is what works because I was involved in burning some pieces of steel on that one. Um, you know, change of use. You need to make sure it's done properly. It's brought up to date. There's a classic example of one being done. Right. That takes me nicely to um, questions and answers. And if I could ask John and Barry to to come on the back onto the onto screen and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sharing so that you've got now got hopefully you've got a nice big picture of, of John and Barry in front of you, um, for which I apologize. And uh, here we go. We've got some, we've got uh, about 13 um, questions and answers. And if there's any more coming through, please fire them in. Um, I've, I've got uh, there's, there's probably more, I'm afraid, that I'm going to be bouncing in your direction, Barry. So I'll I'll start off with um, how about using tools such as as bolster in general um you only you only record the completed install how do you record the whole installation process eg step by step look it's nice and simple start thanks <laughs> um uh, actually we don't record the completed install only we would always take a before photograph showing the um the open void or penetration uh, depending on what it is um uh, if it's a fairly simple fire stop, so a, you know, a 400 by 400 fire stop with a with a pipe going through it, we would then show the completed um, the completed solution by way of photograph, record who did it, when they did it, what materials they used. If it's a more complex um, uh, penetration, larger, we would then um, we would stop our work and we would take photographs of the install installation um, in process. So we would take some before photographs. Uh, some during photographs and a completed photograph at the end, and all of these are recorded on bolster uh, with a with an ID tag so that you know where it is. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, so trying to, I was trying to find one. Um, there was there was another question um, for you. It's sticky labels. Do we should we be looking at a better system which considers a permanent fixture directly adjacent to a penetration? Yeah, I can understand why you'd want that. Um, but we are where we are with it at the moment. We use a sticky label. Um, it identifies the fire stop at the location, which is the most critical thing. Um, it contains a QR code which takes you off to uh, either the OM stored on um, the building owner's website or to the um, installation uh, companies. Uh, website so that you, you know what it is that you're looking at so it has to be held in place and yeah perhaps there's a better option than a, than a sticky label I'd go I'd go along with that okay um John a, a question for you working with a, an intumescent manufacturer they don't advise using two different types of intumescent from other manufacturers even if the generic generic type is achieved what are your thoughts on that Using two different if, materials, one on top of another, or one on top of another, or one one to touch up another. Uh, yeah, well, I don't think yeah, that's going to be a tricky one because uh, you know the performance characteristics of them are going to be different. So yeah, it, it generally would not be advised to do that. I mean, if I suppose if you wanted to uh, do that, you'd have to have some evidence that uh, the two work compatibly. And have been tested compatibly, but uh, typically, no, that wouldn't be something that you would want to do. Okay. Um, a, a question for 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 both of you. Um, what's the the panel's view on the term golden thread? Do you think this will cause some confusion, as the health and safety file is already a mandatory requirement on under the CDM regs? I'm going to um, plead the fifth and say we're. Uh... A passive fire protection installer and uh, how you define your own regulatory requirements and golden threads. And it's not something we need to get involved with too much, Andy. Okay. John, have you any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I mean, all I would say is that, you know, 
terms are terms and you know if that then becomes embedded and people understand it quickly then I suppose it's fine but uh, yeah I mean no, no real feeling on it. No, I, and I must admit, I'd, I'd say the same. I, I think that it's, the, it's the term golden thread is being widely used within the, the work that's coming out of, of Hackett. And I think it will be, um, it will be interesting. It, it's a, a, an interesting term to understand that many people understand. I think it's that term's here to stay and whether it's done for CDM or for Reg 38, or for a safety case, that same information is needed, and, and we need to get we need to be aware that it's it's coming and and, and get ready for it. Um, Andy, one of the questions starts sharp fibre, so shall yeah. I take that? Do you want? To, I was going to say one of the questions starts sharp fibre. Um, so understand that having an ASAP or third party accredited company, but I found operatives are not required to be certified, leading to incompetent installation. Okay, yeah, so I, will let you, I will let you take that one, and I'll. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that um, uh, the majority of uh, professional pacifier protection installation companies will always have accredited installers. Um, they will either be trained to NVQ level or higher. Um, and uh, the ASFP has now um, membership requirements uh, that ensures a level of competency from director level all the way through to operative level. And we as members of the ASFP have to be able to demonstrate that uh, our operatives are trained um, and certified to be able to complete the installation. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, we do, it's said we do, we, we see that. I think that going forwards, what one of the things that we're going to see is an increase in, in the rigor of third party schemes and again the the new competence framework that's out there bs8670 is talking about competence of the individual in terms of skills knowledge and experience as well as the competence of the organization and so we're going to have to look at these going forwards okay um question a question i said i just seen i just seen one for that i was going to to, to uh, John, there was a question about um, about primer. Is the da, 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 where's it gone? Uh, well, sorry. I'll, I'll... Right. Okay. So, uh, question to either of you gents: uh, Are there any processes to test and certify the fire resistance of an area, room, floor, or building as a unit, not the individual PFP product? And is there any rating system indicating that, covering that? Sorry, Andy, say that again. Sorry. I was going to say, no, I'll tell you what, I'll deal with that one. Uh, mm -hmm. At the moment, the moment, no, is the, is the simple answer to that one. We test pacifier protection products as individual products. They're all covered by their own individual um, standards. There is talk of setting some systems to, tests up and there is a discussion there is a discussion within uh, product testing at the moment in the UK as to whether we can have more system based tests but they tend to get very very complicated because you end up with multiple products interacting in ways and, and in different ways and so that's why we have to why we have to do why we have to look at that going forwards and we will be do, we'll be doing see, seeing some more work on fire testing of product as as in schemes, I think, going in systems going forwards. Right, where did that? The question you're looking for about uh, primer was yeah. in, the chat, in the chat box. Is it in and the it, chat box? It says, what is the best solution to go. retrospectively protect existing structural steel where the primer used isn't known? My experience from talking with thin film intumescent paint manufacturers is they won't guarantee anything unless the primer is known. The DFT is tested and the steel was blast clean correctly. How are we going to know these things from existing building with very sketchy ONMs is the only solution to encase. So I'm happy to give my response to that. If there's a, a refurbishment project uh, that you're attending and there is a primer up there, you don't know what it is, um, there is no way of knowing that a layer of intumescent paint applied to an unknown primer will adhere uh, you're talking about a, a chemical reaction with another chemical reaction and there's uh, there's absolutely no proof you've got no proof that the two will work together 
Um, so if you want to fire protect that steel with an intumescent paint, the only way to go about it is to completely remove what's there by shot blasting or similar, and then reapply a primer that you know works in conjunction with the intumescent coating that you want to use. However, a, a more cost-effective solution might well be to consider a boarded solution or a cementitious solution, both of which can be applied over the top of the existing primer. You don't need to know what it is. I was going to say, you can actually do some sort of chemical test to determine what the primer is, um, and if you wanted to, and, and then work out its compati that compatibility from that with the primer, going, with the product, with the intumescent you're proposing to use going forward. But again, it, it comes back to that, that if it's already got intumescent on it, and it's and like we had on that, that picture I showed earlier on, piece of steel that's about 20 years old, sat outside, Yes, you can use it in that, but you're supposed to maintain it. That's obviously starting to show signs of breakdown. If you don't know what that, that intumescent was that was applied on that piece of steel when that, that building was built 20 years ago. Uh, and in, indeed, it may not even, that product may not even exist today. How are you then going to maintain it? And if certainly if you don't know the manufacturer that you're going to talk to, that gives you a real problem. And they are very difficult analytically to work out a cold case what they are. Um, Craig asks an interesting question at 12.28. Craig says, does a fire stopping installer become responsible for the whole of the fire stopping in a building, i.e., yeah. if only adding new, is there an obligation to ensure the previous installs are also compliant to current standards? Yeah. Um, there is a requirement to ensure that previous installs are compliant to current standards, yes, um, and that's why you'd have regular fire risk assessments, but that's not the fire stopper's uh, responsibility. Um, when installing fire stopping, uh, the company that installs that will provide a certificate of conformity mm -hmm. to say that they've installed their products in accordance with manufacturer's guidelines, but they can only obviously certify the products that they've installed. They can't certify anybody else's work, uh, but your fire risk assessor and your regular assessment of the building um, will determine if previous installs are compliant. Correct. Um, there's, there, there's been a, a, one question from um, Marcus Phillips, uh, representing company responsible for thousands of residential buildings. Um, he's being told that information to satisfy the new regulator is going to cost somewhere up to £35,000 to get the ne necessary documentation retrospectively. Um, who's going to pay for that and what documentation will be required as no one can provide a definitive list at this time. And I'm afraid I, I can't provide a, a definitive list at this time. We're still waiting for the to see a, a pro forma for what a safety case will look like. But there's a, you know, look at the regulation list of regulation 38 and it tells you the sorts of information that you can imagine there's going to be asked for. Um, to, for information, there's a BS out there, BS 8644 on the requirements of data storage, um, which is going to be used for golden thread. Yes, we're, that's a, it's a very good point. And, and we're aware that that standard's going forward. There's an awful lot of new British standards works being done on, on, on this, on competence, on assessment of external wall systems, and, and all a lot of those. There's also a new BSI for uh, companion standard for ISO 9000 for construction. And so there's a lot of work being done on this. Um, and, and we'll see those standards and how those standards interact in, with construction going forward. I, we've got, I'll take, we'll, we'll take one more and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll finish. And he says, um, uh, um, where there's been third party uh, compliant, com fire stopping completed, and there's now a single cable that requires running into the compartment, would you suggest new penetration or breaking into the existing and then rectifying and making good again? Um, I'll take that then, Andy. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming what's happened is we've got a residential building or similar where some new comms has been put in and uh, uh, the uh, installation company have installed some fiber optic, a single fiber optic cable through an existing um, mineral wall bat. I think that's what the question is. Would you agree, Andy? Yes. Yep. Then, depending on the size of the hole formed, no, the fire stop can be repaired. Um, if they've made a very small hole, uh, the size of a cable, we can repair that without having to need to remove everything. If they've smashed through it with a hammer, as we have seen, 
uh, then we will need to remove the whole fire stop to be able to comply with uh, absolutely we've regularly seen holes precision cut with a claw hammer um and and it is a, a big prop it is a big challenge going with that going forwards i think i it, one of the things i would say is you probably need to know who's if you you would need to know who's that mastic you've got so that if you do pass the cable through and you're going to repen reseal the, the the seals with the mastic you're using the correctly approved mastic in conjunction with the correctly approved but with the tested bat and it's possible to add extra seals into extra cables and whatever into a seal you can have um you can have uh, penetrations with more than one pipe and cable in it but that's that's how you need to you need to make sure that the testing allows you to do that right Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, that's been really useful. I'm just going to try now and bring that screen back. And if I bring the screen back, um, okay, that's uh, the 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 close of today. I'd like to I'd like to thank uh, Barry and John for helping us out with that. Uh, we will. I'll, I'll get the Q&A compiled and having got in the chat box compiled and having got the Q&A in the chat box compiled, we'll have a go at that. Um, at answering the stuff that we haven't answered. We will circulate also a video link so you can watch us again if you, if you would like to. Um, and for those of you who've missed it, um, beyond that, as a reminder, uh, I said we'd put this up again. So within the next, if you want a CPD certificate, there's the email to send it to within the next two weeks, please, and we'll get those out to you. And also a bit of a of a of a lobbying um, and and advertising activity. So SFP is having an awards lunch in Manchester, and tickets are on sale for that in November. And we've also got an it's an awards lunch, so award nominations, and there's half a dozen awards up are available, uh, they're, they're there, please have a look at those and see if you've got a project of the year, an advocate of the year, training um, an individual rising star of the year or the innovation of the year. And that, that will be, those awards will be announced and awarded at our awards lunch. And our awards lunch is on Friday, the 26th of November, 2021 at the Edwardian in Manchester. Um, we've got we've got two sub, sub sponsors for that already confirmed inside Rise and Action Air. Two more being confirmed, with, which we'll be able to release shortly. And there's a there's a fifth sponsor availability. Um, so have a if you want to get involved in that, talk to Georgina, as you can see her email address on the screen. Otherwise, um, you know, get yourself up there, and hopefully we may be able to see some of you there. Beyond that. Um, so next up, we've got a member update on the 11th of August, and we'll be doing a webinar looking at some structural protection issues on Wednesday, hopefully on Wednesday, the 18th of September. Uh, more webinars to be an announced beyond that. So keep an eye out for those in your member updates. And you will also note that hopefully you'll note that the ASFP websites had a, a bit of a, a, a tweak and is now looking all posh and rebranded. So thank you very much for everyone for joining and we hope to see you all soon. Bye.